Good morning, church family. My name is Lucas, and I am here to bring you announcements. So let's get into it. Um, our first announcement is we have a mother and son event, a Nerf War Night, on November 19th um, in the South Building. If you have any more questions or if you want to um, sign up, contact the church office or contact Laura Dunn for that. Um, the second announcement is we have a pie and Pinterest night for the women in our church. This is on December 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, Lisa asked me to announce that we uh, to bring $5 if you're going to come along with an item, either like a shirt or a bag or like a tote of some sort. Um, apparently, Shelby's Sassy Designs is going to provide <laughs> a number of different Christmas items that you can decorate your different items with. So that's really fun. Also, bring um, a pie to share. This is a great opportunity for um, you women to invite your friends just for a great night of fellowship. So I encourage you to bring there, if you, or encourage you to come there for that. If you have any more questions, sign up at the info desk or to contact the church office or contact Lisa Hubner for that. Our third announcement is this upcoming Thursday is on November 10th is our annual homeless night for our youth group. Um, this is basically just an annual fundraiser for the Salvation Army. If you have any empty, large cardboard boxes that are just laying around in your basement or in your attic, then um, if you could drop those off at the church office, that would be great. We'd really appreciate that. And the last announcement is Financial Peace um, University. Yeah, University is coming back in 2023 in January. Um, I'm sure Lisa is going to have more details I'm in the foreseeable future. So the last thing is we long to become a biblical community of kingdom people who are joining God in the restoration of all things, one person, one place at a time. And we gather today um, to worship him, to be formed in his image, and to be sent out on mission by him. So if you could stand and join me, join me in prayer before we go into worship, that would be great. Father, we thank you so much for your love, and your grace and compassion that you just pour out for us every single day, Lord. Father, you are the reason why we sing. You are worthy of our song. So as we enter into a time of worship, just give us an opportunity to rest at your feet, rest at the cross, and to just take everything that might be heavy on our hearts to you because you are such a good father and we just thank you for, so much for that we love you so much and in Jesus name we pray, amen Oh 
unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice you would reign, and every knee will bow. We bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. Trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are the Torah. We lift up in our heart. We lift the name of Jesus from age to age. Your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus from age to age. You reign. Your kingdom has no end. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. Welcome, whether you're here in person or joining us online, we're just so glad that you're here today. And community is such an important aspect of what we believe in here. And so if you are new with us, we have an information desk in the back where we'd love to meet you and get to know you a little bit better and join you in your faith journey. Let's continue to worship together. Give me eyes to see more of who you are. May what I behold still my anxious heart. Take what I have known and break it all apart. For you, my God, are greater still. And no sky contains, no doubt restrains all you are. The greatness of our God, I spend my life to know, and I'm far from close to all you are. The greatness of our God. Give me grace to see beyond this moment here To believe that there is nothing left to fear And that you alone are high above it all For you, my God, are greater still And no sky contains restraints all you are the greatness of our God I spend my life to know and I'm far from close to all you are the greatness of our God and no sky contains no 
doubt restrains all you are, the greatness of our God. I spend my life to know, and I'm far from close to all you are, the greatness of our God. sometimes about how worship is so much more than the songs that we sing. And I read this this week and just thought it was a beautiful picture of what worship can be. And I wanted to share it with you this morning. Sometimes even more than our songs, even more than our melodies, worship is letting go of the thing we love most and looking towards him, trusting it will be okay. It is to let go of our preconceived good ideas before we've had a chance to search his heart. It's believing that he is good even when it feels like you're giving good away. It is believing the promise in your heart even when it is no longer in your hands. It is believing in the deliverance even if you may never see the exodus. Worship is climbing up a mountain and starting the fire, trusting he will provide the sacrifice. Worship is stepping down into the river and trusting he will provide even in the midst of your sacrifice. Worship is letting go of the sun you hold in your hands and knowing he will be caught in God's heart. It is the freedom of the next generation by way of surrendering your will for the current one. Worship is trusting the gaze of his eyes when he says let go. Because while we can only see the sacrifice, he sees the salvation. While we can only see the end of the line, he sees the start of a new one. While we can only see the suffering, he sees the sun. May we see the sun, and in seeing the sun, may we see his goodness. And in seeing his goodness, may every sacrifice be worth it. From the moment that I wake up, 
Until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. You have been faithful All my life You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice have led me through the fire in darkest night you were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God would you stand and continue singing with me all my life you have faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God your goodness is running after it's running after
completely before you because you are worthy of all that we have to give and all of our praise and I just pray that um, our hearts would be receptive to the truth and that you would have us here this morning Lord and that we would be able to go from this place this morning focused on um, just how worthy you are of, of every moment and of every breath in Jesus name I pray amen yeah you may be seated good job um, yeah this, that last song started do you feel the world is broken. Do we? We do. Can we just take a moment, just um, just bow our heads and pray? We all live in and feel the brokenness of the world in some way. Um, that's part of what we're going to get to at the end of when today's sermon when we get in Genesis 3. We live after the fall. And the reality is, is we're all, even when things are great, there's something broken around us, right? So I just want you to, just for a minute, to just pray, and whatever that is, offer that to you. If you're right now, like I'm not in the midst of it, just give thanks, and um, just, yeah, just take a moment to, to take whatever it is you're, is going on in your life before the Lord. broken world, um, and we feel it. Things are not as they should be. 
we have a sense that there was something better at one point and there will be something better in the future, new creation. But we live in this time um, where things are as they are. I thank you, as we sang this morning, that your goodness is running after me. And then even in the midst of that, um, as Sarah shared, Lord, that we just let go because we trust that... Um, that we see the suffering, you see the salvation. And so we really want to cling to that. And we pray in the name of Jesus, um, our pursuer. Amen. Yeah, wasn't that really great worship? Good to worship our Lord. Yeah, just the whole thing about his goodness running after us. Uh, in the last week or two, I'm in the, back in the Psalms right now, but David said uh, he had the conviction, I don't remember which Psalm it was, but that um, I will see your goodness in the land of the living. Because his goodness is running after me. And what? Psalm 23. One of our the favorites. The ones you always use at funerals or whatever. Right? That applies to all of life. Pecked it at this summer. Where it says at the very end of that. He says. Surely your goodness will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's good news. Right? Okay. Um, Anna Black. I'm going to have Anna come up. For just a minute, Anna has something that she's going to share. As she's coming up, I'm curious. We're going to be back in Genesis. Uh, did everybody, were you able to grab the text this morning when you came in? Because um, we're going to be referencing that sheet a lot. If, if you did not get one, would you raise your hand? And if you have one from last week, there was an error on it. So God, in his sovereignty, was making me live through what I'm preaching this morning. So if you have last week's with you, you might want to grab a new one. But if you don't have one, would you raise your hand? you don't have one of those sheets because it's Genesis 1, 2, and 3. We're going to be spending two more weeks in that. And um, so it would be really helpful if you had one. Thank you for all of you that are helping pass those out. So I see a few more hands over here. Again, feels like the old revival days. I see that hand and I see that hand and I see that hand. So, okay, Anna Black, come on up. This is Anna Hello. Yeah, Hello. that's good. Wow. Come I, up here more often. <laughs> yeah, I never get that. We should trade roles. Okay. Um, yeah, Anna's been our financial officer since May? May, yeah. May. Yeah, since May. And if you were here in August when I preached through like Psalm 103 or 104, 107, one of those, 108, she came up and just shared her journey with that. It was very powerful. Um, have known Anna. She was born really close to Carissa, our oldest daughter. We've known her a long time. Her family love and care about them. And we'd love having you on staff. You're a great addition um, to Good all to of there. us. Yeah, not just the financial stuff, but just your presence, your heart, your spirit, your ideas, your love for the Lord, everything. So she's going to briefly just share a financial update. You probably got one of these in the way in. Um, we try to do this quarterly. And last one of the year, so, yeah. Anna? Yes, so I will make this short and sweet and painless. Um, so, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you guys for um, just your generosity and your giving. And we really, truly couldn't be here without your generosity. So, I just wanted to say thanks. Um, but also, um, just to draw your attention to a couple things. Um, first of all, you can see over here, missions. Um, that kind of middle column, or the middle of the missions column, um, is our giving, and um, we have a surplus in giving for missions, so that's really exciting to see your guys' heart for um, missions. Um, and then secondly, um, you can see in the middle um, is Local Ministries 2021 giving, and Local Ministries 2022 is off to the other side. Um, and so our giving for our, um, 2022 is, um, yeah, even greater than 2021, so just exciting for that, to see that, um, see your generosity there. Um, however, I did want to point out that um, our our expenses do continue to outpace our giving at this point, and we have a deficit of around seventeen thousand. Um, and that is kind of where we're at for the quarter. So yeah, yeah, that's all. I have. That's all you have. That's all I have. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, obviously, you do have these sheets, and this does give more information, more detailed. If you enjoy looking at all those numbers, all that information is provided for you on these sheets, and you can take a look at that. Um, yeah, yeah, and if you have any questions, I'm at the office, so. Yeah, or in, inundate her and swarm her between the services. We'll just get everybody around her, yeah. yeah, and just ask her <laughs> questions. Thank you, Anna. Yeah.
Anna, you are really popular. I had no idea. Um, we're having you up here more often for something. I don't know what, but something. Yeah, even on this thing, it's this. Uh, this is a good thing. Can be a, th- that first top local ministry. That's the most important one. The one under it. We always underspend our budget, um, so that one is really confusing. But the thing she pointed out right now, we do have that seventeen thousand dollar deficit. The giving is up about, I think, fifty thousand over last year, which is great. You've been very generous. Um, we're still trying to work our way out of post-COVID and a lot of other stuff, so appreciate your generosity. As you come to the end of the year, it's very common for people to have some end-of-the-year giving that they want to give towards ministries or places they really believe in, and as you're praying through that, if you're a part of the family of 12th, okay, if you're, not, if you're here visiting, you can uh, turn this off right now, okay, but if you're part of our family, we would just like you to prayerfully consider perhaps um, making part of an end-of-the-year could go to 12th to help us to to catch up on that. We're a lot closer than we were last year on that, so, but just want to let you know. All right, Mel and Brandy are going to come up this morning. They were not able, here for the missions conference, weren't able to share. Mel was on a honeymoon in Colorado. Nice choice. Congratulations, sir. And Amanda is back here. I know, Amanda, you probably don't want to get pointed out, but I did it anyways. I do have a, you guys come in the middle, I do have a quick question. What color, what color is Brandy wearing? What is this? Yellow. A yellow? Yeah. Now, forget the stripes. What color is Mel wearing? Mustard yellow. Okay, mustard yellow. But it is yellow. And are we in agreement on that? Okay, not brown? It's brown? Are you sure? Okay. Or orange. <laughs> or orange. Okay. We're, I'm having fun with, with Mel. We were having this conversation back there, and Nellie had no clue what we were talking about, but she just thought it was funny and broke out in <laughs> hilarious laughter of it. So... Tell us a little bit about the ministry focus, and then I know there's a need you want to share. So, Okay, so um, focus is basically like um, volunteers here from 12th Avenue that love like um, international students, and we seek to meet their needs, their spiritual needs, their um, survivor needs, and their social needs. Focus basically stands for friends of overseas, um, college, and, and university students. And um, that's what we do. We try as much as possible. The students that come from other nations to Emporia, we try as much as possible to meet their spiritual needs, um, survival needs, and then social needs. Yeah. Um, first, we want to address uh, those of you who signed up at the ministry fair. When was that? Back September. September. Um, it's taken a little bit of time to just get those names and um, get organized a little bit. So we apologize for the delay. We have not forgotten you, and we will be contacting you soon, and we're super excited to see where you can plug in with international students. So if, you, if that is you, hang tight. We're, we're getting there. Um, and then just to kind of give a little bit of, like, a status of, of how the ministry is going, um, as Mel said, the social, the spiritual, social, and survival needs is kind of like the three areas that we try to meet with international students. And just across the board in all areas, we have crazy low participation from students. And that's kind of it in a nutshell, low participation. Um, I mean, students are, like, numbers are going back up at ESU from what they're getting compared to COVID. But, um, yeah, we're just not sure... Um, why they're not wanting to be involved in a lot of things, um, especially the spiritual uh, realm is very low. Um, and so that's just been a little bit hard, but um, we're working through that. One neat thing, though, um, we do have, okay, so spiritual, I should say, low participation seeker-wise, just people interested in God, is very low. But we do have um, recently some believers here who um, have really been enjoying our fellowship on Sunday mornings and are excited to be a part of that and to even step into some leadership roles, um, leading worship, maybe some Bible lessons, um, and then just reaching out to their peers on campus to try to bring them in. So that is just a new recent thing, um, and that'll be a prayer request later, but we're excited to have that, um, that enthusiasm from some believers. Um, and um, also, we've had some, some pretty good participation in Mel's soccer ministry. Um, he plays every Sunday 
try to, um, and that's a, that's a great way for students to come and in a non-threatening environment and um, be a part of that. And then also his Walmart ride on Fridays. He shows up at Plum Hall and with the church van and takes whoever needs a ride to Walmart, and so he's had some, some consistent numbers with that too, so we're thankful for that. Um, next up, our activity is Thanksgiving, two things. Um, the church in Burlington, Kansas, always invites international students to their meal, and so we love to take students to that. And then, of course, our Thanksgiving host families on Thanksgiving Day, um, we always love pairing up students with members of 12. And I'm going to let Mel do that plug. Yeah, and um, again, part of um, some of the survival needs is um, um, during Thanksgiving um, Day, usually most people either travel to see their families, and then some of the international students don't have anywhere to go. And so um, within the years, um, what 12 Avenue have been doing is some of the families that are able to bring students to their homes to share their meals with them, um, we pair them with them, and then they go over there and then enjoy Thanksgiving, and then see how Americans celebrate Thanksgiving um, on, on Thanksgiving Day. Um, the, the, the thing that we want to kind of um, let you guys know this year is that, just like Brandy mentioned earlier on about low participation, um, we want you to prayerfully consider hosting a student, but also kind of keep in mind that you may not be able to um, host somebody today um, or this year. Um, because of low participation, but um, just be available, and then when a student sign up, um, and then we reach out to you, um, yeah, um, should be ready, and then be able to host them. And if if you are interested um, in hosting a student this year, um, feel free to either call the office, um, call myself or Brandy, and then the, the office will either direct you to one of us or um, the other volunteers um, um, for for you to know if we have a student for you this year. All right, prayer requests. Can yeah, we jump and, into if, that? Can, can somebody like grab you this morning after service if they're interested in the Thanksgiving thing, or would you rather they just contact the office? I mean, if you can find me, I'm going to be <laughs> going, but Mel. Yeah, yeah, grab Mel or, or grab me or something and let the office know if you're interested in that. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, yeah, we have some prayer requests. Um, again, just for student involvement to bounce back um, and that. Students would get excited about being a part of a community. Um, and then also, probably more importantly, um, just for uh, us as volunteers to really have like a, a clear um, sense of what God is doing. We don't want to just do fun things, activities, programs, just because they're a good idea. Um, but we really want to do what God is leading us to do. Um, and so... Yeah, our kind of core group has been uh, feeling like this season right now is kind of like a rebuilding time um, where we just need to really um, be listening for the Lord's leading. And then in the future, you know, we'll see him work in great ways. So if you would be praying like for that core group um, to really hear from the Lord um, and, and you guys as well, um, that we would follow God. And, yeah, listen to him. Um, and then also I would ask for prayers for Mel and Amanda, the new couple. Um, we're excited for Amanda to jump in and, yeah, just for God to beautifully weave them into the focus ministry and use their unique giftings. They have very different giftings um, as far as, like, serving students. And so, yeah, just for God to work all that out and um, help them. Uh, enjoy serving together as a new couple. And then also, like I said, for that those new believers that are wanting to be involved, that God would really work through them and um, uh, grow them while they're here in the relationship with him and um, just use them in great ways. So, yeah. yeah. And one cool thing about the, the believers that are around is a, a number of them are also involved in our fellowship in here, right, for service and in serving. I mean, a number from Ghana, from Nigeria, where else am I missing? Tanzania, that have, that are serving here. So, uh, yeah, so that's really cool to, if you ever peek back in the the, the tech booth back there, you'll see um, a number of them serving. So that's just really cool. So, okay, can we take a minute and pray? I want to pray for you guys and your ministry. Father, I lift up, even right now, Mel, as I 
place my hand upon him, he and Amanda, as he with they with regular lives and schedules are really striving to help give leadership to the ministry with the time that they have. And I just pray that you would give them wisdom and just that tension I know of wanting to have more time to be involved but not able at this point, that you would give them wisdom as they figure out what that looks like. Um, you're the Lord of the universe. You're the one who's in sovereign over all. Would you be drawing um, the students you know that need to be involved into it? Thank you for the believers that are um, have gotten involved and how they're they're growing. Um, thank you for Madonna, and I pray that you would continue to move her towards yourself, that you would keep her having a seeking heart. Um, for Yui, wherever, I'm not sure where she is right now in exchange, but that you would be, continue to draw her to yourself. Um, pray for the Thanksgiving, that if there are students that are going to be here alone, Lord, that they would sign up, that they would reach out, that we would have families that would be willing to love and meet their needs. Um, and Lord, I, in my age, don't remember everything Brandy shared, but you are over it all, and you're Lord of it all. Would you please um, be blessing that ministry, giving them wisdom as they try to figure out next steps and the best ways to serve. And thank you for the commitment of Brandy and of Mel and of, Lord, that core group that just still is so involved and who give so much to be part of a welcoming ministry. And we pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Good job. Yeah, we can get it on stage. Close. It's his fault. Like, he is, like, he can't, the Ghanan thing, he misses the snap all the time. I'm like, I nail it. It's a joke. <laughs> Steve's great at it. I'm horrible at it. Um, yeah, that was probably the revenge for the yellow thing, right? Like, having me fail on stage with that. Um, yeah, I, we've got this color thing. Mel has this color thing with people all the time, like, not totally agreeing. So, when I came in this morning and Mel said, Garen, I've got a question. There was a group back there, and they're like, what color's Mel's shirt? And I said, purple, just to throw them all off. It was, it was pretty funny. So um, God, is, God is at work. And, you know, when we talked about the missions conference, four types of response, right? To, to go, to send, to welcome, and to mobilize. And one of them is the welcoming. God is continuing to bring the nations here to us. And Thanksgiving is one of the main ways over all the years that we worked that we can really show the love of Christ. Because it can be lonely on campus if you have nothing to do. So just really pray and think about that, having somebody to your home. Um, and God, again, thanks for your generosity. God continues to be at work. Um, we take this moment to just remind ourselves that part of our worship is in our giving. So if you're part of the family, not a visitor, but if you're part of the family, just remember we have the giving boxes um, as a place to, to do that. If you're giving cash or checks, if you give online, um, you can do that. We should have the we usually have a thing up here that shows you where to do that. If you're home, we want to give you that, that chance to do that. And we'd like to take this time to pray. But just remember in Luke 12, 15, that Jesus said, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And don't we need to be reminded of that all the time? It's so easy to get sucked into, in our culture, just stuff and having more stuff. Life does not consist of that at all. What life consists of is loving the Lord my God with all of my heart, my soul, my strength, and my mind, and loving my neighbor as myself, because these are the, the two great commands, right? And so we, we want to worship him, and we want to treasure him above all else, because if that's where our treasure is in him, then our treasure, then we're freed up from it, and we don't have to be enslaved to our stuff. So let's take a moment and just go to the Lord in prayer. Continue to pray for Clark Rusko as he recovers from his surgery. Had a few minor complications, nothing major right now, but just... Keep him in your prayer. Um, Jan Jeffries, who is here this morning. Jan, where are you? Over there. Great to see you this morning. So, a um, few others who have health issues. Somebody we've been praying for, unnamed, came in this morning and said, it was great news, the test. So, we're so glad to hear that. Um, so, made my day. So let's take our, those things to the Lord, anything on your heart, and just being open to the word as we go to Genesis this morning. So let's take a moment and pray.
Lord, thank you for your rich generosity to us, um, for the life you give us, for a church family and a place we can worship you. And we just now want to come before you in your word, and we want to see and learn what you have to say, and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, we are going to be in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 this morning. If you've got the sheet, the, some of the words on here are really significant, so you, I encourage you, you can perhaps follow along on that. But we're continuing the series on work, that your work matters. Um, I think this series is really important for a number of reasons, but one of them is a large number of people wake up every day very disillusioned about work and asking the question or thinking, there's got to be more than this, more than you think. Um, according to Paul Goodman, author of Growing Up Absurd, a recent book, more than 70% of all Americans get little or no satisfaction in their jobs. That's really high. Gallup did a poll recently, found similar numbers that 70% of Americans are not engaged or actively, they're actively disengaged with their work. Um, that's why I saw a guy with a t-shirt that had a t-shirt that said this, we, the unwilling, led by the unknowing, are doing the impossible for the ungrateful. Um, that's how a lot of people feel about their work. And, you know, Christians aren't exempt from those numbers. We're not necessarily exempt. Um, Many people do find some disillusionment or feel like they're not finding meaning in their work. And there's a lot of people that see work as a curse. The scripture is going to speak to that in a minute. To them, it's a necessary evil. It's just what I have to do to earn money so that I can support my family and survive, uh, to make that next paycheck, to make it. Um, a lot of people feel that way. And a lot of people ask the question or think, is work a curse? Is it really a curse? And what we're going to see this morning is it is not a curse. That's not how God designed it. It's the furthest thing from the truth. Um, that, so I'm really excited to get into the Word. So we're going to be in Genesis, starting in Genesis 1. And what we're going to learn, last week we talked about serving the God who works. And this week we're going to look at how the God created humanity to work. So He's the God who works. He created us to work. So we're in Genesis chapter 1 to start with. And I want to look, show you three places in Genesis 1 and 2 where it talks about, shows that we were designed for work. And the first one is in Genesis 1, verses 26 to 28. has a lot of significant words in it. So if you would join me in reading Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And there it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and over the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And this is the word of the Lord. Those three verses, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, have been called by theologians the cultural mandate, the mandate to create culture. Um, someone has called it the first commission, and that's really, that's a great thing. We know the, grant, the great commission, right, to make disciples of all nations. Somebody says this is the first commission given to humanity. And there's so much I could say in this text. This is one of the most foundational texts in all of Scripture. There's so many themes in Genesis 1, 26 to 28 that go all through Scripture, threads that are so important. I'm just going to hit a few things, and I want to zero in on a few words, three in particular. I want to look at the word rule, the word subdue, and the word image, because they're so significant. significant. First is the word rule. We see it two times. It is in verse 26, and it's in verse 28. It kind of bookends... Um, these three verses. It's the Hebrew word rada, which means to reign over. That's what rule means, right? It, but what's really cool about it is it is royal kingly language. It was used of kings and people in royalty. So it's not just like ruling in the sense of having control, but it's like this, this sense of dignity to it. Um, and that's important because what that word tells me is that God, he's not just running everything by himself, but that he actually gives the ability to rule and to govern to humanity, that he actually made us his vice regents in everything that he's doing in creation. So we have a very significant role. The word subdue, which is in verse 28, to me is almost even more cool. It's the Hebrew word kabash. Um, Jewish people still hear that. Have you ever heard of somebody say, put a kibosh on it? That's this Hebrew word that they're using. Um, it means to tame something that's wild, 
to tame something that's wild or to bring order out of chaos, bring order out of chaos. And I'm not going to go into all the detail here because in Genesis 1, God is forming and filling. He is bringing order out of chaos. He is taming the wild. But interestingly, he stops in chapter 1. He creates a garden in chapter 2, but then he tells them they've got subduing work to do, that there's still, cool, there's still like chaos out there. There's still things needing to be tamed. And I'm not going to go into all the details why, but what, essentially what's going on is outside of the Garden of Eden, there is still this unconquered wilderness that's very not tame at all. It's very wild. And so he's telling humanity in verse 28, he says, I want you to be fruitful, increase in number. I want you to spread, not just stay in the garden. You're going to spread out of it. And as you spread out of it and you get into the wild areas, I want you to subdue that and to bring order and to tame that. And I want that garden to, as you spread to extend to the whole creation. Really significant work, right? That act of ruling and subduing. And then is the word image, which occurs three times. So anytime you see words repeated, it's really important. Three times we see the word image. Um, it's, in, it's in verse 26 and verse 27, three times. Um, and here's why this is significant, because we were created by a God who works, and then we're created in his image. And what that means is as part of the image, especially in this text, part of that image is in us doing work. That is one of the ways that we reflect him is when we work with him and we work for him. Um, it's an essential part of his nature, and we image him by letting it be an essential part of our nature. I mean, it is an essential part. We'll talk about that. So this, ver these verses, 26, 27, and 28, are so profound because in the beginning of Genesis, in Genesis, those first six days, we see God forming and filling the earth. We see him reigning, ruling over it. We see him subduing it. And then in day six, he creates humans and he said, now I'm passing the task on to you. You now reign, you now subdue, you now form and you now fill the work I started. I want you to continue and take that and keep doing something with it. So he calls us in verses 1, 26 to 28 in this first commission to the very same work that he's been doing in Genesis 1. And this is so powerful because we talked last week about all the ancient cultural myths back then of creation and how God... The gods created humans to be their slave labor so they could have leisure. But what we find in scripture is a God who creates humans, not so he can have le le leisure. He's a God who works, who creates them to work, um, creates them to have that work and that kind of dignity, and that he's calling them actually to be partners with him in his work, to be co-creators, co-workers, co-laborers in the ongoing work of what he's doing in the world. So that's the first place we see that we were created for. The second is in chapter 2, still on the first page of this, chapter 2. I want to read verses 4 to 15, so if you could join me there. Second place we see the humanity, our call to work. So verse 4 of chapter 2, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work it. By the way, I'll stop for a second. That implies he created it for somebody to work it, right? That's implied there. All right, so there was nobody to avod it, to work it. But in verse 6, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made grow out of the ground all kinds of trees, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I want you to skip down to verse 15. We're going to hit 10 to 14 somewhat next week, but verse 15, and it says this, Then the Lord, the Lord God took the man, Put him in the garden to what? To, to work it and take care of it. To work it and take care of it. Um, both of those words are word works. To work in Hebrew is avad. And the word to take care of is shamar in Hebrew. To avad means to work or to cultivate. Cultivate being to promote, develop, or improve the growth of something by labor and attention. So that's what he's saying. I'm putting you in this thing to work at it, to labor at it, to improve it, to develop it. And then shamar means to keep, to watch, to, to tend or to attend to. And we're going to look next week at those two words. Um, there is so much treasure in this one verse and in those two words 
that I am so excited about next week. Actually, I was, next week's sermon was going to be in this week's, but as I was busy on this Tuesday, I'm like, there is no way I'm going to get all of this in one sermon. So I'm learning, okay? I'm learning. I'm going to cut that part out and wait till next week. But that, to me, is maybe one of the most significant things we're going to look at in scriptures next week. So don't miss it. I'm very excited about it. But these two words, to, to work, to avad, to work, to shamar, to keep, to attend to, these are like stewardship words. I talked about stewardship a couple of years ago. A steward is a person who's been entrusted with something and given the responsibility to manage that thing according to the owner's vision, values, and desires. And the good stewardship then is the careful, responsible management of what's been entrusted to their care. So humans are created to steward, to work at, and to steward the very thing that God had created. And then chapter 2, verse 18. So flip to the back of this sheet if you've got it. Genesis 2, 18. We're going to read 18 to 20. The third place that we see work for humans here. So in verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And so here in this text, these verses, we see the naming of the animals. And in their culture, that was really significant back in that ancient those ancient Near Eastern times, because to name something meant you ruled over it and you had authority over it. So it really, it signifies his ruling and reigning. Um, but there's something even more cool. God could have named these animals. Do you know that? Go back to verse one, I mean chapter one with me. Go back to chapter one, flip the page back over. Look at verse five. In verse five, it says this, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So we see him naming in, in chapter one. Look at verse eight. In verses 8, it says, God called the vault sky. Okay, look at verse 10. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called what? He called seas, and he saw that it was good. So we see God naming in chapter 1. God is more than capable to name things. But he doesn't name all the animals. And again, I think it's because he wants partners working with him in what he's doing in the world. So he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some of the naming work to you. And so he gives that off to Adam. I mean, can you imagine what it was like naming all of those animals? I mean, for those of you that have children, especially if you get past two, the first two naming is kind of easy, right? Because you, you come up with your favorite boy and girl name for the first one. And then she, he or she is born for us, Carissa, so you give her the girl. You've still got the, se- the guy's name to put in your pocket. Um, and then for the next one, you're like, but we had our second favorite girl's name, right? But by the time you get to the third, you've kind of run out of names. And a lot of times it's a struggle. Um, a lot of parents with the third kid, it's really hard. And so maybe you end up doing, uh, kind of what my parents did. We have no idea. How about just something weird? How about Garen? So you just throw a weird name out there, right? And then you get stuck with it the rest of your life. Um, but I mean, think about this naming of the animals. Um, what that was like. I mean, could you see Adam, God just bringing him one at a time? And I'm sure he brought a puppy, right? He's got to bring a puppy. Right, aw. So um, he wasn't there to do that yet. But, and he goes, uh, let's call that one dog. And then God brings this and he's like, cat. That's cat. And then, oh, yeah, cow. <laughs> Over here we have some naming going on. That's really awesome. That's the work of Adam and Eve. Um, and then, yeah, Adam's like, Pig, definitely pig. That's the word for that thing, right? And then he says E I E I O, and with that, right? So, um, I mean, I'm just imagine all this, like, like, whoa! I think that'll be a zebra, and like, wow, look at that hippo! Oh my, <laughs> that's gotta be elephant! And whoa, look at that! I mean, can you imagine seeing all these things? I'll call that one giraffe, right? Um, how about this? Ah, horse, that's easy. And then this. Yeah, easy, I know. How about this one? Adam's like, God, you, do you have copyright on C? You did that in chapter one. God's like, no, you can have it. All right, seahorse. Seahorse for that one. And then, can you imagine this one? Like, uh, duck, okay, that's duck. Uh, beaver. Duck beaver. And God's like, that doesn't, no, no duck beaver. Okay, platypus, right? Um, 
here's what is so cool about this. Because in chapter 2 earlier, the Avad and the Shamar, that's physical labor. But here he's doing mental creative work, right? That's what he's doing here. And here's why that's so important. We talked about this last week. This divide we have in our culture and in our minds between white collar and blue collar work is false. It's not biblical. If you remember, God did both kinds of work. And here we see humans doing both kinds of work. They're doing the physical manual kind of work and they're doing the mental creative type of work. I mean, manual's creative too. Um, but we see them doing. So again, all work is God's work and all work is important. I love how scripture um, confirms that and emphasizes that to us. So here's what we see in Genesis 1 and 2. That God creates the man and woman. He creates them to image him. And in doing that, he gives them this, he entrusts with them this ongoing work to be at work in his creation of creating and of forming and of working and cultivating and naming. He's giving them responsibility to take on all of it. And I think that's really cool. And what I learned from that is, is what we learned from Genesis is that we were made to work. We serve a God who works and we were created to work. Specifically to continue the work of God in this world. We're made for it. It's central to being human, right? We're created for it. We're called to it. It's in our DNA. Work, it's just hardwired into us. It's built into us from the beginning. It's something that, that kind of wants to come out of it. It's, it's in our bones. Tim Keller said this, Work is as much a basic human need as food, beauty, rest, friendship, prayer, and sexuality. Amen. And that also means we're not only are we designed and created to work, but that there is dignity in work because we're doing the very thing God does. There's dignity in it. Work is a noble thing. We are ennobled when we work. It gives us a deep sense of importance. What I learned from scriptures, we need work to thrive emotionally, spiritually, physically, um, mentally, at all levels, we need work to thrive. And that's why unemployment is so devastating and depressing to people. That sense of kind of meaningless when that happens because we're designed to work. We were not meant to be idle. There's one particular place where our family has seen the goodness and the dignity of work in a really unique way. I wish I could take you all there, but I can't. It's Bethesda Place in my hometown in Hayes, Kansas. Um, Hayes had a very famous institute for people who were mentally disabled. And our church had a ministry with them. And I actually, the first thing I ever served, baby believers, I actually taught a class with several of those guys in it. And especially back then, those institutes that were created, the institutions, they were good. Um, but it was mainly you just kind of, you do, they did things with them. And, but it was missing a really key ingredient. And so a couple in Hayes, Kansas, Tom and Shelley Stafford, started a ministry for the, ministry dis, the, the mentally disabled. And if I'm using wrong words, forgive me, because I just don't, these days, I don't know what you can or can't say. But they started this ministry for mentally disabled men. And they started the ministry with this conviction that every human being is created in the image of God. Every human being, no matter our ability or our disability, we're all created in the image of God. And that every human being is capable of and is intended to produce and create and work and that we all get dignity from that. That was a core conviction of theirs. And I want to tell you, the ministry they created, it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. Um, I wish you could see it. Those guys... With the family, they lived together, they played together, they prayed together, and I want to tell you, they work together. Every day they put in a good day's work. They do so much stuff. They have planted a tree farm, and every year they're giving 100 trees to landscaping firms in the Hayes area to use in landscaping. Isn't that really cool? I just was, uh, was in contact with them, and they said the first tree that they got, the first trees they got, when they got planted, they got planted uh, upside down which is just cute, right? They had to go out, dig them up, and, re and turn them over. Um, but they, they have this tree farm. They also, from that farm, they have a number of trees they'll cull out every year and chop up for firewood that they sell. They grow in a pumpkin patch every year, not just for fun, but they actually give pumpkins and other things. They grow a giant garden. They eat their own food to self-sustain themselves, and then they sell it to other people in the community. They do woodworking, and this is how I first found out about them. I was a baby Christian, and every year in Hayes at the mall, they would be selling these wooden ornaments that were handcrafted that were just the most amazing things, and it was made by those guys. And that's how I first got to even know about the ministry. I forgot I was going to bring something. Maybe next week I'll show you some of what they make. Our house at Christmas is full of their stuff. 
Um, and what's cool is, is their ministry is totally self-sustaining from the profit of the work those guys do. Isn't that cool? They actually, it's self-sustaining. Here's what it says on their website. We have discovered that just because someone cannot cut with scissors does not mean they shouldn't use a bandsaw. Or that not being able to count to three does not prevent a person from driving a truck. Here's their vision. It is our hope that the residents of Bethesda Place can encourage others with abilities and with disabilities. That by following their example of hard work and humility, they can contribute to the betterment of their community and the people will clearly see what great assets they are. Isn't that cool? It's so cool. And if you go there and get to know those guys and you spend time with those guys, I want to tell you, when you look in their eyes, you see this amazing level of joy because they have this dignity of, of just of being loved for who they are, but the dignity of work. You can just see it in them. I love that ministry and what they do, how they provide for themselves. Um, and they're just the, the most loving guys anyways. Uh, sometimes Pat and I on way to Colorado will stop and stay. They, have an Air, a, they actually run an Airbnb on their property, okay? These guys do. And they take care of it. And so we'll stay there. But they always, they always encourage them because they always want to see who's staying there. And they just tell the guys, you know, don't, uh, you know, you've got work to do. Don't always feel like you have to see everybody. But they found out, if they find out we're there, the next morning they'll all be out like chopping the bushes and stuff. Not <laughs> because they just want to say hi. So uh, it's really cool. But here's what I want you to see in all of this. That in Genesis 1 and 2, we see God's plan for work. Work that was intended to be fulfilling and intended to be fruitful. That was his plan for work from the very beginning for humanity. And I talked about this a little bit last week. I want to say a little bit more. That this view of work was radically different than any other, any other creation myth, any other religion, any other worldview that was around them at that time. Because in almost all the virtually all the ancient cultures, they saw work, especially manual labor, as something that was beneath the gods and that actually put humans on the level of animals. It was like beastly. To work was beastly. That's, that's how they viewed work. But the scripture is the total opposite. In the Bible, work is God-level activity. Is that not cool? Work is God-level activity. And work is something that actually separates us from and it elevates us above the animal kingdom. That that's how significant work is. But also to those ancient people, they saw work as a curse. You all know the story of Pandora's box, right? A God gives Pandora a box. It's full of all the evils. They say, don't open it. She gets curious. She just pulls it open for a minute. A bunch of it escapes. I think except hope. She closes it and hope gets stuck inside. But of the, all the things that come out of that, death and decay and disease, one of the things that comes out of that is, what would you guess? Work. Because they saw it as a curse. And I said it last week, but again, for thousands of years, even in old Europe, this is how people saw work. I quoted this guy last week, but I left off the last phrase of what he said. George Chapman in 1605 wrote, do nothing, be a gentleman, be idle. The curse of man is labor. The curse of man is labor. And though we don't have that same view anymore, we don't believe those old myths, I think a lot of people in our culture still tend to think of work as a curse. It's just a means to an end. It's just to make money, to take care of my family, and then hopefully to have some extra left over so I can really live on the weekend, right? Because it's about the weekend. It's about the leisure that's most important. You'll hear people talk about just two more days and then the weekend. I was working on this sermon Tuesday at ESU when I was on the second floor. It's usually pretty quiet up there, but it's open to the side. You can hear stuff going down on the first floor. And I heard it, overheard a guy meet another guy, and the guy said, how's it going? And the guy said this, it's only Tuesday, and I'm ready for the week to be over. There's so many people that that's how they feel about work. But I want you to know, this is not the view the Bible takes. In the Bible, work is a good gift from a good and gracious God. So in chapter 1, verse 28, that verse in particular has the job description for humanity. And the first word that it says after God in verse 28 is God blessed them. So work is a blessing. It's a good thing. Work is a gift. It's not a curse. It's not garbage. But it's a gift. Future sermons, some of us take work and make it a God. That is where we get the main meaning of our life. But I just want you to know it's not garbage, but it's a gift. So the view of the Bible is revolutionary. It was then and it is now. 
So last week I ended with these questions. Okay, that all sounds good, right? Sounds good. But if work is so good and if it's truly a blessing, then why is work so hard and so frustrating at times? Why is it that work sometimes feels more like a curse than a blessing? Why is that? And scripture is so profound. The answer is in Genesis 3. So we're going to look in Genesis 3. We see in Genesis 1 and 2, the plan, God's plan for work in Genesis 3, we're going to see the problem of our work. The problem of our work. Genesis 3 is the story of the fall of mankind, right? Their rejection of God's reign over their life, their rejection of relationship. They're saying, we don't need you in our lives. And the fallout of that decision was disastrous. It affected everything in creation, everything. that it set These dominoes in effect that touched everything. Everything was, became marred and corrupted by their sin, including our work. Tim Keller says, the fall of Adam and Eve, and therefore the rest of the human race into sin has been disastrous. It has unraveled the fabric of the entire world and in no area as profoundly as our work. So look in Genesis 3, 17 to 19. I want to show you Genesis 3, 17 to 19. And 17, speaking to Adam after their decision. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the fruit of the tree, from the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Now, let me ask you, this is important. Does he say cursed is your, your work is cursed? No. What's cursed? Okay, the ground. That's really important. Through painful toil, you will eat food from, all, from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat food, your food. If you have last week's, that you will eat your food was left out by accident. You can write it in, last week's sheet. You will eat. You will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. But verse 17, cursed is the ground because of you, through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. And that word painful toil is the Hebrew itseban. Sounds like ichiban over here, right? You can go tell them, hey, Garen said, well, never mind. Itseban. Itseban means pain, travail, and toil. Toil. It comes from the root word in Hebrew, atzab, which means worrisome and sorrowful, okay? Strong word. You kind of get the meaning of what's happened to work now? Um, and I didn't put it in the text, but interesting in verse 16 when he says to the woman, I will make your pains and child very, very severe with painful labor. It's the same word, itziban. So even in childbearing now, right? Be fruitful and fill the earth. That's going to be itziban now. And the work I've called you to do, it's going to be itziban from now on. So after the fall, the fields still produce. They still produce. But now they also produce thorns and thistles, right? Thorns and thistles. The ground now is not only fertile, but for the first time, it fights back against us. We're not just now cultivating gardens, the man and woman and us, but we're also fighting the elements that conspire against us in our work. Um, who's ever gardened here? Who has... Maybe your mom did, you've worked in a garden. Okay, if you've worked in a garden, you know exactly what this is talking about, right? Um, so, you know, I love black-eyed peas and okra, plant them every year. If I kind of leave my garden alone, which is going to grow more, those or the weeds, the thorns and thistles, so to speak? Which one? Yeah, 90% of gardening is, I think, fighting thorns and thistles. That's what I feel like. Most of it is that. And you don't have to be a gardener or farmer to feel that reality in your work. We all feel it. Because post-Genesis 3, all work is now painful toil. It's all itziban. All of our work has been subjected to sin. We're all frustrated to some degree in our jobs now. Every single one of us. We live in and work in workplaces that are messy and broken. And thorns and thistles are common in everything we put our hand to. Doesn't matter what it is. Right? And that's the problem of work. Post-fall, while work can be fulfilling and fruitful, and it still is. It is now frequently unfulfilling, and it's frequently fruitless. What was intended by God to be joy, our joy, is now this big mixed bag of both good and bad. Even the best jobs at times are difficult and frustrating. Is that not true? You can have the dream job, and there's still things that frustrate you about it. But for a lot of people, work is only pain and frustration. And it doesn't matter the workplace, Christian or not. 
All of us and all of our workspaces are affected by the fallen by human sin. All of us experience that in our workplaces. All of us feel disillusioned at times. All of us have goals and dreams of things we're going to accomplish, and some of that stuff never comes to fruition, right? Or you put into effect something you've planned, and what they call the, the principle of unintended consequences come in effect, and you're like, you do a good thing, and you find out five bad things come out as a result, right? That's part of work after the fall. Um, even in good jobs, some of our tasks are just boring. They're boring. Um, after the fall, people experience fatigue and burnout. People feel overworked and underpaid. After the fall, every one of us, no matter how good our coworkers are, they're sometimes annoying and irritating, right? There's strife, there's conflict, there's gossip, there's jealousy, there's envy, there's elbow throwing, there's ladder climbing that goes on in work. Some experience injustice in their workplace. It's no wonder that people call work the rat race, right? Because it can feel that way at times. And let me say something really important. Before we get too critical of our workplace on those external things and kind of turn, a, turn an evil eye towards our work environment, yeah, the work environment has fallen, but there's something more fallen than our, my work environment. You know what that is? Yeah, it's me. It's my heart. I have a sinful heart. I have weaknesses. I have limitations. I have brokenness. I bring into my workspace every day, and it negatively affects it, Right? And I've got a sinful heart, and that sinful heart impacts me, it impacts my colleagues, my coworkers, those under me, it impacts the people I'm trying to serve. I cannot get away from that. Um, I cannot get away from my own human sin that affects my work. Wow, that's kind of heavy, right? Yeah, so before you cast too much of an aversion to the workspace, you know, I think we all need to start here. And what do I bring? What darkness do I bring to work? And everything I've just described is first world, our world. Um, they're first world problems. In the majority of the world, people live hand to mouth, um, working to the bone, what we would call ungodly hours, just eking out a living, barely making it. So even with our thorns and thistles here, we've got it good compared to most places. You know that? We've got it good. So I want to land this plane. So, Genesis 1 and 2, God's plan for work, his intent that it be fulfilling and fruitful. But then, sadly, it's followed by Genesis 3, which is the problem of our work, which is that many times it's unfruitful and it's unfulfilling. And th these next things I'm going to say are pretty important, so I actually created a slide. Like everything else in life after the fall, work now falls under the curse. It falls under the curse but I want to be crystal clear on this. Work in and of itself is not a curse. It's not a curse, but it falls under the curse. And that's a really big difference. Bl work is created by God, and it still is a blessing, and it still is a good gift. And even though there is pain and frustration all of us experience in work, the plan of God, that original design, I think still shines through. We all find great meaning in our work, great fulfillment. We're drawn to it. So I think God's original plan shines through even above the problems. So we've got this plan and this problem. Um, I mean, what, what I love about this, if I go back to that, and what I love about Scripture and what drew me to Scripture is, is that not true of life? Is that not true to life? The blessing, the goodness of work, we feel it in our bones, the need for it, but there's things about it that just frustrate us. Like we can feel these two tensions running. And Scripture is the only worldview, it's the only religion, it's the only philosophy that holds both of these in that kind of tension, but especially elevates work. And I find it rings so true to life, and that's what drew me to God in Scripture, particularly, is I found so often what it said about life rang true. So, according to the Bible, all work is good. It's all good. All of it. And every kind of work is good. We talked about that last week. And according to the Bible, though, sin entered... Um, before sin, here's what I want to say. Let me not mess this up. It is good. And before sin ever entered into the world, here it comes, before sin ever entered the world, there was work. Work was in paradise. It was in paradise. Work was ordained by God before the fall. That's really important. Before corruption came in the world, there was work. 
And so 12th, I just want to remind you that work matters, that your work matters. We learned last week, we serve a God, we worship a God who works. This week, we are created and designed to work. We, as his image bearers, we're his co laborers with him in his good world. And again, there has never been a religion, a philosophy, um, a worldview that's ever produced such a high, lofty view of work of Scripture. And to me, it rings totally true. And so I ask again, like last week, is not our God and the God and his revelation, is this not amazing what it says about work? And I want to tell you what it says next week about work is even more profound. We're going to take another step that's even a higher step, in my opinion. Um, I am so excited about what we're going to learn from Genesis 2 next week, but let me set it up this way, because I think a lot of Christians struggle with a question that people outside of here don't struggle with, with work. And here it is. Here's the question. To God, isn't ministry really a higher kind of work? Ministry is really a higher kind of work, right? That if I'm not doing church work, my work is second class, right? It's second class. That if I'm not in ministry, if I'm not in church work or missionary work, right, that I'm on the junior varsity team. Is that not true? The people in ministry are varsity, but if I'm not in that stuff, I'm junior varsity. In Genesis 2, 15, there is some deep treasures there. God is going to speak so profoundly to that, and I can't wait to share it with you. It is really really cool. You'll be glad I separated it off as his own sermon. <laughs> Trust me. So, would you stand with me? I want to close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how practical, for how true to reality it rings. Thank you for the fact that not only you, are, you work, but you created us to work, and there's dignity in work, um, for your plan for work. Lord, you know we, we live in a world that's broken. We feel it. We do. And we feel the brokenness in our work. And I just pray, Lord, that all of us, that you would help over the coming weeks as we talk more and get more practical about how to apply Scripture to our work on Monday to Friday, that you would help us to learn to live with some of the, the thorns and thistles and how we can be people who shine forth your gospel at work and we bring your influence into it. Um, but again, like last week, Lord, help us to leave here with our heads, heads held high, knowing that we, in any work we're doing, we're, inva- we're engaged in your work. And may we go to our workplaces this week with a greater sense of how important it is. And may we go into it with a sense of carrying your name into it and wanting to be an influence to people there. Um, That we would be cultivating it. We would be taking care of it. We would be doing all the things that you called Adam and Eve to. And so we pray this in the name of Jesus. That tradesman, that carpenter, that stonemason. We pray in his name, our Savior. Amen. All right, 12, so again, you're sent into your workplace. Hold your heads high. Work has dignity. Seek to be an influence for the gospel there.